Uh oh. Hello, welcome back. Uh, whew. Okay, hello everyone. I'm a little crooked there. Okay. Oh my goodness. Well, they say it's going to rain again. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, I saw a thing. Uh, I saw a post yesterday. Despite all the rain we've had, and despite even in Central Texas, uh, Lake Travis is still 50 feet low. A lot. I, uh, I think the total lake level is like 570 or something. It's a huge, huge lake. But, you know, the, it's the one that con they control the other downstream, like uh, Lace Lake Austin and uh, Lady Bird Lake are downstream, and they keep them at a constant level by sending water out of Lake Travis, which is the biggest reservoir. But still, Lake Travis is 50 feet low. Yeah, 50 feet low. <clears throat> All right, enough about, yes. In Austin? Barton Springs. Yeah, you talking about the natural spring swimming area? Yeah. And here I thought you were going to ask me about Hippie Hollow. I've heard about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, geez, what to talk about today? Uh, so, uh, well, happy Mother's Day to those who celebrate. Uh, <laughs> well, it's so complicated, you know? We want to celebrate for those who want to celebrate. Uh, you know, we, we had someone several years ago here who got inspired in the prayers of the people to uh, try to cover all the situations of mothers they would face. And it was about a 15 minute prayer. You know, it was oversensitive to everything. And that's sort of where we find ourselves. But seriously, it's a good day. And um, our boys even remember to send Allison a present. So you never know. Already? Oh. Okay. See, good things are happening already. So for Mother's Day, I chose a masculine subject. <laughs> this is coincidental, but it's where we were on the list. Hey, Paul, come in. Um, today, the great theme of the Bible I want to talk about is much more complicated than it's going to sound when I tell you what it is. It is the great theme of God as king. Okay, and actually Mother's Day is a good time to talk about this uh, in a backward sort of way because out of this God as king language in the Bible, we get a lot of male hierarchy in the church today. And I want to make the case that that is a misreading, particularly of the New Testament. So uh, when you think about these key concepts, king and kingdom, so a kingdom, it's, it's a word we use all the time, right? And it's a word that's used a lot in the church. A kingdom is a dumb, a place that is ruled by a king. And this is a very ancient idea that we have no experience with, hopefully, uh, with a king ruling over us. Ever since we broke with, you know, King George, uh, you know, we've supposedly been free of that kind of tyranny in the United States. You'll be back. Uh, you'll, you'll be back, he says. <laughs> 
Absolutely. And it seems like a lot of people want a king. Just like, you know, the Hebrew people wanted to return to Egypt. That's not today's lesson. It's another lesson. So we've got to remember that the Bible is situated, particularly the Old Testament, <clears throat> in an ancient society where kingdoms were the norm. There were no democracies in this time. There were fiefdoms and kingdoms and villages and tribes and things like that. It, it is a very different world than the one we live in. And so particularly when we read the Old Testament, I'm still crooked here. When we read the Old Testament, it assumes an understanding of this kind of life. Now, almost every, well, not every, 75% of Disney movies that have ever been made, you know, are kings and queens and princesses, and they're built on this understanding as well, which also helps reinforce this idea to us because, well, it just does. It's so pervasive in culture. But in the church, we've picked up this language and we, talk, we use it a lot in a biblical sense, but beyond. So we talk about the kingdom of God because Jesus in the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God. Well, why is Jesus talking about the kingdom of God to the, in the first century? It's because they lived in a kingdom. He's speaking the language they can understand. He's using parables they can understand. That is not an endorsement of having a king forever and ever. The one exception I'll make to this, because some of you are going to make, come out of your seat at me here in just a minute, is uh, the Bible and Jesus very clearly teach that there is a thing called the kingdom of heaven, and that is a place where God rules and reigns. But it is not an oppressive kingdom. And the problem with so much kingdom talk is that it always assumes a hierarchy. A kingdom requires a hierarchy. And in this Christian kingdom talk, you always have men at the top of the hierarchy. You're all, you're all of a sudden, you're in a Bill Gothard seminar. You've got <laughs> men at the top. You've got women and then you got children, and then you have people of color. <laughs> I forgot to say white men up here. Yes? But, you know, if you go to the home, very often the woman is... Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, this is... By the way, absolutely. Deep Eddie. Oh, Deep... Oh, yes, Deep Eddie. Okay. That's a beer, too, isn't it, or something? No, no. Vodka? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes. You have a more liquor talk for us? Back in the day, would have been called pagans were matriarchal. Wow, okay. Disney needs to make more movies about that. They're not as woke as we think, right? Um, so I lost my train of thought with all this. We're talking about kingdoms, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, and hierarchy. Because when you live in an ancient kingdom, you have a king who tells you what to do. It is a very different thing uh, where you do, not, you do not have individual rights. And again, this is why the American Revolution was so important, although incomplete, right? Because it was defying the rule of a tyrannical king. And yet today, too many people in the church want to think of God as a tyrannical king. And this is why the language of kingdom is really dangerous, dangerous for us to deal with if we're not careful with it. Now, uh, again, just to recap before we move into some scripture and some other comments, the biggest problem with kingdom talk is it leads to hierarchy. And hierarchy always leads to oppression every time because whoever's on top is going to oppress whoever's below, right? Fill in the blanks for what that is. So if you look at the Old Testament, 
and you look for the word kingdom, it appears hundreds of times. But it's talking about the kingdom of Assyria or the kingdom of this or the kingdom of that. It is giving a description of the world in which they lived. It is not making a theological statement about God wanting people to live in a kingdom. In fact, we've talked about this in a previous lesson. I alluded to it a moment ago. God did not want the Jewish people, the children of Israel, to have a king. But they insisted they wanted to be like the other nations around them and have a king. And God said, okay, I'll give you what you want. That's the way the story goes, right? However, <clears throat> when we turn to the New Testament, there's a different thing there. Um, got some notes here. from a. By the way, I'm, I'm reading some notes from a guy who is a Wycliffe Bible translator and serves as professor of international studies at Dallas International University. So this guy's not a liberal, okay? <laughs> the, the word, the Greek word translated kingdom appears in the New Testament 162 times, which sounds like a lot, I know. Of these, 135 refer to the kingdom of God or alternatively, uh, alternatively, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of Christ. These languages, these words get interspersed in here. Uh, and of these 135 instances, 103, the overwhelming majority, appear in three of the synoptics. The kingdom of God appears only five times in the Gospel of John. Only five times. <clears throat> it it appears eight times later in Acts, fourteen times in the only fourteen times in the writing of Paul, once in Hebrews, James, Second Peter, and two times in Revelation. And catch this: most of the other twenty-seven instances of this Greek word refer to worldly kingdoms and Satan's kingdoms. So the Bible not only uses kingdom to refer to the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament, but also to the kingdom of Satan or to worldly kingdoms. So these are referred to throughout the Gospels, um, multiple places. I'm not going to go into all that. Uh, there's a unique occurrence of this word in Revelation 16, uh, Revelation 1 and Revelation 5, uh, where God's people are referred to as a kingdom. Only place in the New Testament this occurs. But they're alluding back to Exodus 19.6, where Israel is called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We know that language, too. So the reference is not so much to God's people as to a literal, as a literal kingdom, but to the saints as a collected group of people, right? Uh, of the 32 references to the kingdom of God outside the synoptic gospels, it is very uncommon for this concept to be used elsewhere in the New Testament. And in all of John's writing, it, it appears in only two segments. Uh, what um, literary, literary study people call pericopes, right? Per, did I say that right? Peri ah, it's a hard word to say. <laughs> One of those is the conversation with Nicodemus that Jesus has. And then three times in one verse, Jesus is speaking to Pilate about his kingdom not being of this world. You remember this exchange where Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you say that I am. Right? My kingdom is not of this world. Okay, interesting stuff there. In all of the of John's epistles, uh, First and Second John, First, Second, Third John, First Peter, and Jude, there is no reference to the word kingdom at all. It does not appear there. Uh, the Book of Romans mentions kingdom only once, once, and this is the book that's considered to be Paul's most important writing to us. 
In other places, Paul refers to the kingdom simply in ethical context. So this author says, the sparsity of kingdom language outside the synoptics suggests a few things to me. And I want to just sort of lay these out for you. Number one, Jesus' teaching on the kingdom was assumed by the apostles. They do not spend any time defining the kingdom or further explaining what Jesus meant. They assume their audience knows what the kingdom means because they've lived in a kingdom, right? The, number two, the apostles knew they were living in the kingdom and needed to hammer out the ethical implications of such living. Here's the important line. Unfortunately, Christians often decontextualize the New Testament's, here's a great word, hortatory material, I mean <laughs> preaching material. Theologians often emphasize the indicative imperative to counteract this, this is a deep word, atomistic reading, but perhaps what we should do instead is to emphasize our existence in the kingdom and ensure believers understand what Jesus taught about the kingdom. Uh, this goes into the new creation. Number three, he says, biblical theology is needed more than ever. Uh, from this, he says, <laughs> I love this for a line, Pauline fanatics <laughs> quickly forget about the kingdom and emphasize something else. While Jesus' devotees preach the kingdom without being able to articulate well the implications of it. Biblical theology requires that we read the entire Bible together without separating pieces from each other. Always a good line there. This, is, this was done out of a, uh, a deep study of the, of the Greek words here. And let me pause before we go look at some examples in the New Testament to ask, what are your initial thoughts on this? And it, have you even thought about this before is the other, other question. I know you have, Melanie. <laughs> Comments, thoughts? Yeah. You mentioned that uh, a, a, higher, I mean, a kingdom invariably requires oppression. So you could say that's something of a tyranny. That's right. Well, I would like to think that a tyranny could be benevolent because I remember my high school math teacher, who was the best teacher I had in high school, among several good ones, yeah. was in the classroom something of a benevolent tyrant. <laughs> she could be tyrannical if you were showed signs of laziness. She was loving and kind and uh, encouraging and so on. So I, I don't know, how, how can it be, you know, that a kingdom could be based on benevolence. So uh, this is a great question for those at home. The comment is, can't, can't you have a benevolent dictator or tyrant or king? And the answer is yes. But let's go back to that other uh, phrase. Um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. 98% of the time. There are some exceptions. There are some exceptions. And I think using teachers as an example is a really good one because, uh, you know, this is the, we all have known teachers like that who ran a really tight ship and they were in charge and they were beloved because they had the student's interest at heart, right? The problem with most other hierarchies is seldom do you have the person at the top of the heap with everyone else's interest at heart. And this is what makes the kingdom of God different from all of the kingdoms. This is why we can talk about the kingdom of heaven as a place of welcome and inclusion rather than a place of tyranny. Yes. This is really one of the markers of differentiation when Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. What he means is it is not like you know a kingdom in this world. It is a different kind of kingdom than what you're used to. We're using the same word? Yeah. Well, I don't know how to say it, but his name is Kierkegaard. Yes. <laughs> that, that sounds right to me. You're doing better than me. Close enough. But he has a brilliant thought about this. And that is that the king steps down on his throne, mixes and mingles among the people so that we better understand them. And Dr. King, whatever he is, he equates that with the, with the Christology. 
flesh. Yes. Yes. As a kingdom and not benevolence, but it deserves a higher word. So for those at home, <clears throat> Jim is quoting Kierkegaard, who taught that uh, the difference with God's kingdom through Jesus is that God steps down from the throne and becomes like us. This is the incarnation, right? And this separates the whole idea of God's uh, kingness, right? Uh, because it is not the way other earthly kings operate, right? And that's a good segue into some of our passages I want to just cite as an example. In Matthew, for example, we find John the Baptist. And do you remember what John the Baptist was known for saying? He could, he, if he wore a t-shirt, he would have put it on it, right? That's Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you think about that language, right, <clears throat> it's not normal kingdom language, right? Because it's calling for repentance to go to something better, not to become the subject of an oppressor. And I think this is a big difference. In the, Yeah. and then we'll come back and it was that this was the new creation sort of this was the beginning of the ministry here on earth we're going to learn how to treat each other yeah we're back to Kierkegaard here yeah. uh, this this is not the kind of oppressed this is the it, it, it's not related the kingdom of heaven is not getting to the cross necessarily <clears throat> it is the incarnation itself yes I guess yeah right the, 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 we tend to skip past that after Christmas, you know, because we're in a rush to Easter always, right? But the message of John the Baptist is the message Jesus himself picks up. Also in Matthew's gospel, one chapter later, chapter four, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Same message, Right? And he goes, uh, Matthew says, Jesus goes throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the coming kingdom of God. Then when we get to the Beatitudes in Matthew, we see this word appear again, over and over again, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There are two times in the Beatitudes where the reward mentioned is the kingdom of heaven. Mark, yes. The is there a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom no. of God? No. Same thing. Same thing. Just, a, yeah, tomato, tomato. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. Is there a difference between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God? <laughs> yeah, great question. So there's three phrases that are used interchangeably. Uh, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Christ. What was the third one? Christ. Kingdom of, our, of Christ, yes. But notice in the Beatitudes when Jesus is teaching, the kingdom of heaven is promised to those who are poor in spirit and to those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. This is not a threat. This is a hope, right? This is not captivity. This is freedom. That's a different way of looking at this. And then just a few verses later, Jesus speaks and says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And Jesus, throughout the synoptics, is talking about entering the kingdom of heaven. It's about getting in, not about not being able to get out. Most tyrannical kingdoms, people are trying to find a way out. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is how do you get in? Do you see the difference? Well, it's got to be part of the great reversal, right? Well, I mean, clearly the, you know, the low will be high and all that. Right. Just even to talk about a kingdom. Turning the word kingdom upside down. So it's not, yeah. not what you think. It's not, yeah. Yeah, the, you know, the, the upside down gospel, some have called it. Uh -huh. the, the last should be first, first should be last, and this is it, right? The kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of earth. All right? So then we get to Jesus teaching the disciples to pray, the model prayer. We say this all the time. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what are we saying by that? Right? Are we asking to have a dictator over us? No, we are asking for the love of God to invade our broken world and to make it like heaven. Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, Paul? Is, is part of this language because democracy hadn't been invented yet? I mean, there's just there's no way to think about a culture without using the word kingdom. I think you're right. So Paul says, is there no way to think about, you know, uh, where you live without using the word kingdom? Because there is no other idea, yeah. right? And what's fascinating about that is those who are Christian advocates for democracy used to, uh, before some of them got taken over with the Kool-Aid, uh, used to base the idea of democracy in the New Testament. I mean, our Baptist publishing houses published reams of stuff about this, right? Uh, I keep wanting to quote the late Phil Strickland, or was this James Dunn? They're sort of the same person. Anyhow, um, who said they, he's never met someone who wants a theocracy who doesn't want to be Theo. So some of you read uh, my story from this week. Um, I officiated a funeral for a man who was just about to be 101, who was on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. I have never met anyone who was at D-Day before. And, well, unfortunately, this man was in his casket when I met him, but still, I heard his story. He, uh, he grew up in Edgewood, Texas, in East Texas, and uh, was born in 1923 and would ride horse and buggy with his family from their farm to the farmer's market here in Dallas to sell their vegetables. That's the world he grew up in. And then all of a sudden, he finds himself in France, unloading out of these ships and planes and everything with the thousands of soldiers who are invading the beaches on D-Day. It's hard to imagine going from that to that, right? And he was one of the lucky ones. He survived the beach landing. He marched 17 miles inland, and then he was shot. And he was left for dead on a pile of corpses, and someone noticed he was moving and picked him up, discovered he was alive, sent him to a field hospital, saved his life, patched him up, and sent him home. He's got five medals, including the Purple Hearts, World War II Victory Medal, uh, a remarkable, remarkable experience. What's fascinating to me about his story was <clears throat> the rest of his life, the next 80 years of his life, was unremarkable. What, what did he do? Various things. I mean, he, he just, he, he didn't, he was not, he was just an everyman. 
right? He was just an everyman, and he was loved by his friends, loved by his family, tinkered around the house, loved to do things, right? Um, would, did not draw attention to himself in any way. But here's someone who was there in this immense fight for freedom. And it really, it was a fight for democracy, we would say today, right? Um, and then comes back and lives a beautiful life as the fruit of his own labor. And I, I, I just was blown away by this man's story uh, because it reminded me that it takes ordinary people, yeah. ordinary people. I mean, <laughs> this is not someone who was seeking glory for himself. He was just a brave soldier who was there and did what he was supposed to do for us, right? And as I said in my Friday Roundup, he, he and those like him didn't go storm the beaches of Normandy to give us a theocracy. They did that for democracy and for freedom, not for tyrannical rule. And yet, we're unfortunately like the children of Israel sometimes. We, we want something we don't have because we don't understand how good we have it, right? And the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is promising really the ultimate freedom through life with Christ with the beloved community of God. How do we get from one to the other? When we pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying for the beautiful community of God to be here as we believe it will be in heaven. Uh, Jim, I had an interesting email from a Southern Baptist pastor who likes me uh, this week. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of my regular, uh, some of them, some, there's several who like me uh, because I tell them stuff no one else will tell them. And he's far, 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 far more conservative than me. They have to use the pronouns. Right? He wrote me um, an email. He said, I've got a story suggestion for you to do. And he said, you need to do it. You need to not get one of your flamethrowers to write it. <laughs> That's his exact language. And he named a few people he thinks are flamethrowers uh, who write for me. He said, um, I think modern-day Christian nationalists are really reconstituted post-millennialists. I thought, hmm. So let me explain what he's saying. So among four primary, four primary views of the end times, one of these is a, a view that's pretty much out of favor now called post-millennialism. And post-millennialism was very popular at the turn in the 19th and very early 20th century. Uh, it was a, a theology associated with the age of progress, right? <clears throat> and the teaching of post-millennialism is that the world is just going to keep getting better and better and better until the kingdom of God is just here among us. So, right? But before World War I, it looked like that's what was going to happen because things looked more optimistic. It was like everything's, the Industrial Revolution and all these things. Now, you're having to overlook a whole lot of other problems to get there, right? You, you got, yeah, again, this is white man's theology, right? White man's theology, right? But it was a thing. So some notable people in the late 19th and early 20th century were post-millennialists. And so my correspondence notion, which I've been discussing with other theologians, uh, George and Curtis Freeman at Duke and I have had a thread going on this via text message, and I've been trying it out on other people, and some buy it and some don't. My correspondence notion is that Christian nationalism today seems to have the notion that you can mandate morality and compliance that will usher in the kingdom of God. And therefore, it's post-millennialism. 
Now, that is not classic postmillennialism, which really was a much more liberal idea of social justice, bringing it that we're going to do... We're going to be such do-gooders here on earth that the kingdom of God is just going to suddenly be among us. This is God's plan is for us to keep loving each other and serving each other, and this will automatically bring, yeah, earth, uh, heaven to earth. Jim? George W. Truman was a strong post-millennial pastor. George W. Truman was a post-millennialist. The, the era in which he yeah. Yep. He was also a racist. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I keep thinking it, so I looked it up. The Roman Republic was founded in 509 BCE when the last Etruscan king was overthrown in Rome. So there was a, there was a republic for almost 500 Oh, interesting. Okay, great point. Actual non-representative type government. Yeah. Democracy, yes. Still, I don't think they elected their leaders. Yeah. So you just talk about Greek culture and the Roman Empire before it was the empire, and you had the Republic, right? Yeah, I feel like we're talking about Star Wars now. Um, okay. Yeah. No, this is a great point. So there were some other things out there. Right? Yeah. The Jewish history that Jesus is speaking into was more kingdom-like. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, well, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to repeat myself on that. Yeah. Uh, other comments before we move on? Some other passages? Jesus says... I haven't even left Matthew yet. Um, Jesus says, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So here Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God being an attitude, a way of life, more than a place. And most of the references to the kingdom of God in the New Testament could be classified in this way. The kingdom of heaven is a concept as much as it is a place. In fact, it really is a concept. It is repeatedly, there is no identification of where the kingdom of heaven is, right? Jesus also says the kingdom of heaven is among you. It is among you now, right? Okay, we talked about that. Uh, we're not going to talk about that one. Um, mm. In chapter 10 of Matthew, Jesus says, again, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or staff for laborers deserve their food. And he's giving these instructions to the apostles that paint a beautiful world, not a world in which you've got to be afraid of everyone, right? This is a very different scene in Jesus' concept of the kingdom as well. All right, I'm trying to get out of the same thing here. Um, hmm. There are multiple parables where Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like something, right? Uh, so uh, the wheat and the tares is one of those parables uh, where, you know, there's, there's the, the weeds among the good, good crop, and they have to be sorted out, right? Uh, the mustard seed is another parable that yeah. the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed someone takes and, you know, small amount of faith. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Jesus uses that one as well. Um, 
on and on and on. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field where someone goes to find it, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a net that's thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. Uh, and then he says, oh, this is, yeah, this is controversial, right? He says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this is where the Roman Catholic Church gets the idea of Peter being the first pope, right? We look at that differently, <laughs> obviously, right? Uh, then just a few verses after that statement in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells the disciples, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what does that mean? Right? So, to those who heard it first, you can understand how they would think of this as Jesus, you know, kicking ass and taking names, finally. Right? But in reality, Jesus seems to be saying that the coming kingdom of God will be, if we, no, based on what we know now, we can look back and say it had to be a reference to the gift of the Holy Spirit among us in the post-resurrection state. And that in this way of thinking, the kingdom of God is among us now. That's a very different way of thinking of kingdom, right? Now, you know, I'm jaundiced, and I've just been to too much bad religion and see too much bad religion. And I get really worked up sometimes over the misuse and overuse of the word kingdom in the church. Because it's just one of the most churchy words you can use, right? Uh, there, there was a, years ago, and I don't know if this is still, there was a kids curriculum for church called Kingdom Kids, right? And one of the problems with a lot of the uh, abusive theology today is actually teaching children about hierarchy. Uh, how many of you were uh, GAs in a Baptist church? Okay, girls in action, girls auxiliary, right? And what kind of structure was it based on? It's based on a hierarchy, right? Because you... You could earn different ranks. This was the Southern Baptist uh, alternative to Girl Scouts. Right? And Royal Ambassadors was the Southern Baptist alternative to Boy Scouts. Right? Because those were secular. Right? Anyhow, that's another lesson. But even in this Southern Baptist culture that some of you come from, there, you were taught a hierarchy in the kingdom of God. Because you earned your way up to different ranks in this thing, right? Mark, yes. Were you in RAs? I was briefly. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it was not a great experience. Yeah. Um, the, oh, the 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 Baptist Brotherhood. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's not my thing. Yeah. Anyone here go to Mount Lebanon? Yeah. All right. The the Dallas Baptist Association camp. So I, Girls in Action is another example of this, right, where you're, you're learning about the kingdom of heaven as a hierarchy and a lot of curriculum. I mean, you, go Google this if you want to see what, look at like Christian uh, king and queen stuff. And you, you can go to a Christian bookstore and find swords and shields and all these things, right, because... They're trying to use this to teach things like the, the teaching of Paul to put on the breastplate of righteousness, right? And the shield of faith and, you know. And how many of our hymns carry this language over as well, right? It is militaristic language. Yeah. So we sing Onward Christian Soldiers. Uh, we sing Rejoice the Lord is King. Okay. Onward Christian Soldiers has a rather militant beat to it, too. 
Yeah, you need some timpani with that, uh, for sure. Jim? Yes. So Jim has asked, how do you relate the second coming to what we're talking about in the kingdom, right? I think this is really the ultimate question for this. Because when Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is among you, right? And we get back to that passage I just read where he says, some of you will not taste death until the kingdom arrives, right? We're always looking for this great and glorious something else. And this is back to my notion of post-millennialism. Because this idea that I'm about to say, once upon a time, fed a notion that the kingdom of, of heaven was just naturally going to evolve among us, Right? And certainly World War I put the kibosh to that. Yes. It, you, you, it would be hard to be a post-millennialist after World War I, and certainly after World War II, right? It just changed our whole attitude on things, our understanding. And yet, and yet, what we're back to trying to preach and teach today is that the kingdom of God does live among us, in the way we treat other people. That, that we are, am, here's a great word, ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are not soldiers for Christ. Soldiers go with the sword in hand. Ambassadors go seeking peace. See the difference? We discussed this Wednesday night. Oh, you did? Okay. And what did y'all decide? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad there's a connection here. Yeah. Um, I was going to get into an article. I'm, I'm out of time, but I'll, uh, one of my writers, who's a pretty deep thinker, Rick Pidcock, wrote a piece uh, two years ago called Three Stories from Jesus About the Danger of Hierarchy and Gratitude. That's what it looks like. Printed out. And uh, he's talking about uh, the parable in Luke 18 uh, where uh, Jesus tells the rich young ruler to sell all your own to sell all you own and distribute the money to the poor but the rich young ruler sees the blessing of his financial status as something he can't give up in exchange for a lower status in this right uh, and he says these stories that Jesus tells may appear to be random but they fit together to be Jesus' own critique of hierarchy. Each story features men who see the world through the lens of hierarchy with their position being above others. And at the end of each of those stories, he says, those men are confronted by Jesus. Their hierarchy assumptions are confronted. And I think if there's any main thing I would like to say after today's lesson, it is this. When we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or Christ as king, I hope we can be thoughtful about what that means in other than a militaristic, yes. dictatorial sense. It is something entirely different because we're back to this idea of the upside-down gospel, that Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is not like the kingdom of this world. And what we have seen what history has known of rulers and subjects is not the same thing. Now, we can have a whole other discussion because Paul talks about being slaves to Christ. Uh, and again, that's another lesson. But the two things go together. It's occurred to me that one of the reasons why this is so appealing to go back to that notion of the kingdom and yes. authoritarianism is because our world seems to be coming apart at the seams, you know, just <clears throat> exploding, everything's going wrong. And one of the things about a kingdom is, it is certainty. So as Christians who want to be part of the kingdom of God that's different, requires us to be deeper thinkers about 
what all this means and not be so quick to jump on the bandwagon. I could not have said that better. That is a beautiful line. Yes. Sarah Beth Smith, Smitzer from Maryland says to get to the step of clean, she had to memorize the last part of Proverbs chapter 13 about being a virtuous woman. Oh, 31. Yeah, Proverbs 31. Yeah, the virtuous woman. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So I want to go back to this, this, this beautiful comment here, right? Uh, I think this is the essence of what we're trying to say. A lot of people want certainty in their lives. And a, a king gives certainty. You know where you stand. You know what the rules are. And sadly, there's two kinds of people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> those who demand certainty and those who don't, right? And some of us are rebels. But what a lot of people have forgotten is just like what a certain person I know teaches, preaches all the time. <laughs> if we want to live in a democracy, you've got to work for it. That's right. If yes. you want to live in the kingdom of heaven, you got to work for it. You yeah. don't just announce that that's what it's going to be. That's right. Right. And part of that in our great Baptist tradition is believing in the priesthood of all believers. That God can speak to you and not just to a pastor or a bishop or a pope. Right. This is this is part of this, that you have the direct ability to hear from God and to know how to live in your own life. Right. Uh, Responsibly, of course, not irresponsibly. Okay. Well, I'm, we're up with time on that. I, I hope this gives you something new to think about. And uh, we're going to be singing some of those hymns, those Kingdom of Heaven hymns. And when you do, you know, you might just ponder it. My uncle, who recently died, who was a, a, a pastor his entire career, uh, once said years ago that he decided he was going to stop singing the hymns he didn't believe. And he would just stand silent. <laughs> Either the ones he didn't believe or couldn't couldn't live up to, right? <laughs> I think of that often, right? Okay, let's pray together. <laughs> Thank you, God, for the glorious kingdom of hope that you've given to us. And we pray that you would help us to be ambassadors for good, for your cause, for your hope in the world around us. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen.